Right. Your life. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. We're just going to wait a minute to let people come onto the link. We see some of you have already posted where you're coming from, but we would love to hear more. We see Canada and Spain and England represented so far. Wow. As well as the US. Do people really come in from around the world for your oh, yeah. lectures? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we did our um, race in the Regency mm. series, there were sometimes five and five continents represented. And Wonderful. <laughs> All right. Well, let us begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Jane Austen and Company. My name is Anne Ferdig, and I am the co-director for Jane Austen and Company. And tonight, I am joined by my co-host, Dr. Inga Brody, and Dr. Susan Allen Ford, and our technical director, Malika Amoruso. And tonight we welcome Dr. Jane Darcy to talk about Jane Austen and the science of sea bathing. Uh, yes, Susan, it's my pleasure like to welcome Dr. Jane Darcy. While researching uh, 18th century, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, we can hear you, but you're can a little you frozen. Me? Why don't we uh, have no. Dr. Brody read the biography? Absolutely. Um, so while researching 18th century medical history for I'm her book, get out. Melancholy, are you hearing me fine? Yes. Is, are you hearing me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, while researching 18th century medical history for her book, Melancholy and Literary Biography, 1640 to 1816, Dr. Jane Darcy had tantalizing glimpses of the world of sea bathing cures. Her subsequent work on Jane Austen made her want to find out more. Why did people start off by drinking seawater, for instance? And what exactly constituted a dip in the sea, let alone the dipper? She presents some of her findings in this talk. Dr. Darcy was a teaching fellow in the Department of English at University College London and the Department of Comparative Literature at King's College London until her recent retirement. She founded Dr. Johnson's Reading Circle at the Dr. Johnson House in London and reviews for the Times Literary Supplement. She's also a theater and film critic for the Reviews Hub. Uh, we can hand things over for, to Malika to explain the Q&A. Welcome to YouTube, our streaming platform. If you would like to leave a comment or ask a question, please use the comment feature on the sidebar. Or if you do not have a Google account and you cannot comment there, please feel free to email us at the email down on your screen, info at janeaustinandco.org. Thank you, Malika. Uh, just a note for everyone watching tonight's event is recorded and will be available at the same link in your email as soon as the event has finished. Uh, and yes, this is new. So unless we need to make any edits to the video that will be available immediately. And so without further ado, I would like to hand things off to Dr. Jane Darcy. Thank you, all of you very much indeed. And hello, hello everybody. How nice of you to come. Um, oh, and my slide has appeared. This is all good. So let me begin. We know Jane Austen enjoyed sea bathing. We get a rare glimpse of her at Lyme Regis on the Dorset coast in September 1804, writing to her sister Cassandra. The bathing was so delightful this morning and Molly, a maid, so pressing with me to enjoy myself that I believe I stayed in rather too long as since the middle of the day, I felt unreasonably tired. Most of Jane Austen's letters from this period of her life were destroyed by Cassandra, as I know most of you know. But we know that what sweetened the blow of her parents' sudden decision to move to Bath at the turn of the century was the plan to travel. 
The prospect, oh, I've forgotten this one. This is a map, and not a very easy one to read, but showing you the counties of England. You can see London is the gray matter to the right. Um, and if you've got a chance to get close to it, which I don't, uh, you can see Kent to the uh, right-hand side. The key places there were Margate and Ramsgate, about which more later, Dover. Um, then we squirrel round to East and West Sussex with uh, Hastings and other prominent places, Brighton, of course. Then the one bordered by yellow is both uh, Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, uh, of which I could say a lot more if you ever asked me, and, and Southampton, where, of course, Jane Austen, her mother and sister, moved um, e before they made their final move to Chawton House. And then edged by green is the county of Dorset, and right in the corner with Devon, you can possibly see Lyme Regis. Um, so, um, what Jane Austen wrote were delighted about plans to travel, and this is the slide I need. The prospect of spending future summers by the sea or in Wales is very delightful, she wrote in uh, January 1801. We subsequently hear they're staying in various seaside resorts and refusing an invitation to spend a summer in landlocked Shropshire. Austin privately telling Cassandra, for the present, we greatly prefer the sea to all our relations. But she was a discerning visitor. Not all seaside resorts were the same. She, uh, on one occasion, she mentions an acquaintance who talks of fixing at Ramsgate. Bad taste, she remarks, adding, he's very fond of the sea, however, some taste in that, and some judgment, too, in fixing on Ramsgate as being by the sea. Um, I added a little photograph when I went to visit Ramsgate. It's a perfectly nice resort now, but um, you will recall in Pride and Prejudice that Ramsgate is where um, Wickham, uh, took Georgina and tried to seduce her. So Ramsgate gets a bad rap from Jane Austen. And we should note the seemingly obvious point that Jane Austen associated the seaside purely with pleasure. This is stranger than it seems because many contemporary accounts, both professional and personal, focus on the therapeutic value of sea bathing. Enjoyment didn't come into it. So, for instance, Jane's racy cousin, you'll remember Eliza de Fayid, took her young son to Margate in the winter of 1790. Her physicians having told her that one month's bathing at that time of the year was more efficacious than six at any other. Despite Eliza's description of the severity of the weather conditions, it sounds absolutely awful. Um, the cure seems to have been effective. She says, the sea has strengthened him wonderfully and I think has likewise been a great service to myself. I still continue bathing, notwithstanding the severity of the weather and frost and snow. So an early pioneer of cold bathing. And for many others in the period, sea bathing was a serious business. Jane Austen clearly enjoys satirising some extreme views on the subject. Hence, Emma Woodhouse's father, boldly dissents from contemporary medical opinion, asserting, the sea is very rarely of use to anybody. I'm sure it almost killed me once. And then comes Sanderton, the novel she began in January 1817, and which ill for health forced her to abandon, a full-blown comedic treatment of the ever-flourishing craze for sea bathing, and now with added faith in the therapeutic qualities of sea air. Here is Sanderton's Mr. Parker, extolling the virtues of this newly developed coastal resort. We should remember that as an entrepreneurial businessman, Mr. Parker has strong incentive for seeing Sanderton flourish. He held it as certain that no person could be really well without spending at least six weeks by the sea every year. The sea air and sea bathing together were nearly infallible one or other of them being a match for every disorder, of the stomach, the lungs or the blood. They were anti-spasmodic, anti-pulmonary, anti-septic, anti-bilious and anti-rheumatic, 
Nobody could catch cold by the sea. Nobody wanted appetite by the sea. Nobody wanted spirits. Nobody wanted strength. Um, and I will come back to some of those terms later in the talk. So my next question is, how did Mr. Parker get all his scientific or quasi-scientific language? Um, the image there is somewhere actually Jane Austen didn't go. It's just a very nice bit of Cornwall. And I love this picture and have it as my screensaver. Uh, it's around the corner from a place near Penzance called Mousel, spelt Mousehole. But Cornwall, I think, was too far to be on anybody's itinerary. And it was actually a working coast. It was fishermen, not seaside resorts. So from early in the 18th century, Georgian medicine began to focus on the workings of the nervous system, rejecting the ancient doctrine of the so-called humours. And you'll remember, I'm sure, that for centuries, medical wisdom had held that the four bodily fluids, which included, of course, black bile, were what determined um, our characters and that black bile an excess of it caused melancholy. This was starting to go out in the early 18th century as attention started to be paid to the nerves. And you know that by the early 19th century, even Mrs. Bennett knew she had nerves. And it completely changes the attitude to melancholy um, because it's now attributed not to some rather repellent idea of black bile that made you so sour and miserable, um, but oversensitive nerves, refinement. Again, I'll come back to that. Physicians pursued the notion, and it's an important one, but I haven't written it down for you, that by analogy with Newtonian physics, one underlying law would be discovered to govern all human physiology. Wouldn't that just be wonderful? You find the key and it just works for everything. Where the health-giving properties of mineral water had long been endorsed by the medical profession, it was Dr. Richard Russell who published in 1753 a dissertation on the use of seawater in the disease of the glands, particularly, I can't really read that from here, uh, the scurvy, jaundice, king's evil, leprosy and glandular consumption. You wouldn't think it would be a bestseller from that title, and it was written originally in Latin for the medical profession, but it had an extraordinary afterlife. Um, so first published in 1753, Russell's book seemed to suggest that the sea might very well be the long sought after cure all. Interestingly, at a time when a successful medical man might have laid more emphasis on his well-to-do patients, Russell's wealth of case histories concerned patients from all walks of life. He records treating farmers and their families, domestic servants, the captain of a ship, even a 13-year-old Jamaican boy. Russell, who died in 1759, so the same decade this book was published, could not have foreseen that he'd come to be seen as the originator of the fashion for sea bathing. And the little plaque that's on the um, bottom left of your slide, um, I think I took the picture, is um, a house in Lewis, which is an inland, um, lovely town in Sussex, um, associated with Tom Paine and all sorts of other radical figures. And they attribute uh, Russell as being the founder of Brighton as a bathing resort. And he apparently was born and practiced medicine in this house. Indeed, in 1861, the French historian Jules Michelet would go as far as to call Russell the inventor of the sea. What a claim. Russell's aims were more modest. He simply wanted doctors and their patients to explore this overlooked natural resource, one that was available to all. His patients reported near miraculous cures, having bathed in or drunk seawater. Other physicians took note and made their own experiments and observations, reporting similar results. Thus began one of the great cultural phenomena of the Georgian period, the rise of the sea bathing cure. And as a direct result, 
of the development of English seaside resorts as rivals to the inland mineral spas, which you all know, Bath, Tunbridge Wells, Bristol Hot Wells, etc. One particular thread of Russell's thesis, however, became central to the development of seaside resorts as the new sites of health and pleasure. His discussion of the healthiest places to bathe. You, when you hear this, you'll realise it's just thoroughly practical. The situation should be clean and neat, he writes, at some distance from the opening of a river. Well, no one particularly wants to bathe in a muddy estuary. The other reason is so the water may be as highly loaded with sea salt and other riches of the ocean as possible. Russell's idea, a key to Jane Austen's Mr Parker and his claim for Sanderton. And this picture, the background rather blurrily, is a picture I took when I was walking along the Dorset coast between uh, a pretty little village called Budley Salterton, where um, the late Hilary Mantel was living. I didn't meet her. And it, around the corner, you can't see it, but it is Sidmouth, which has long been associated with Jane Austen, although hard to find much detail on that. So there is Mr. Sanderton boasting of the delights of, sorry, Mr. Parker boasting of the delights of Sanderton, the finest, purest sea breeze on the coast, acknowledged to be so, excellent bathing, fine, hard sand, deep water 10 yards from the shore, no mud, no weeds, no slimy rocks. Never was a place more palpably designed by nature for the resort of the invalid, the very spot which thousands seem in need of. Furthermore, and I think I've included that on the slide, it's not like the rival, the nasty Brinshaw, the paltry hamlet, as Parker refers to it, that lies between a stagnant marsh, a bleak moor, and the constant effluvia of a ridge of putrefying seaweed. They hadn't yet discovered the powers of seaweed. For good measure, he adds, some most insalubrious air, roads, Proverbially, proverbially detestable, water brackish beyond example, and to cap it all, it's impossible to get a good dish of tea within three miles of the place. But Russell was not claiming the sort of originality that would be subsequently attributed to him. His statement that the ideal seashore should be sandy and flat for the conveniency of going into the sea in a bathing chariot shows that the craze for sea bathing predates him. Bathing chariots, or as we then called them bathing machines, are thought to have appeared at Scarborough on the northeast coast of England as early as the 1730s. And I've looked up old um, engravings of the place. <coughs> and sure enough, you can suddenly see them appearing. Bathing machines would stay very much a feature of seaside resorts for 200 years. And I one day went to the archive, the Kent archives, and found a little pamphlet rather uh, unexcitingly called Model Bylaws. And if we could slip the slide on, there are three slides about, yeah, let's stick with that one. Thank you. A bathing machine. Uh, I'm not saying much here, but I'm happy to answer what questions I can on these wonderful vehicles. Um, I think it's quite easy to think they've just transformed themselves now into beach huts, which are now as big a craze as ever. Um, so um, in the Kent archives, I said, there's a pamphlet entitled Model Bylaws, issued in 1929 by the Ministry of Health. The section on public bathing continues to cover the use of bathing machines. And there had been decades of bylaws issued by the different coastal resorts or their council authorities um, really concerned about how many yards there should be between bathing machines set up for the use of women and those for men, um, how far into the sea they went, all sorts of things, and sort of how much they charged. They like taxes in the old days. Um, so what I found interesting in 1929 um, is there's one important difference, this model bylaw, which is now going to cut that all the resorts could use rather than they're each making up their own. Uh, the guidelines admit to dropping the regulations about the prevention of mixed bathing because, quotes, they have very seldom been adopted in recent years. 
And that is just a key to a whole cultural change. There's no longer the insistence that men and women bathe in separate areas. Um, in fact, the guidelines on bathing machines are already obsolete. The 1930s becomes the era, as you know, of lidos and swimming pools, outdoor sports, and above all, the acquisition of what one contemporary called a coat of tan. Completely new, the idea of suntanned. And if you get curious by this, if you go to the Welcome Collections, um, very nice website where everything is free to use, including this image, um, you will see some of these things. If we have the next slide, this is a lovely one from the Welcome Collection. It hasn't quite filled the screen, but never mind. Um, it's, uh, and I've now forgotten who it is. It's not Gilray, it must be Rowlandson. Um, whether this ever happened or this is just a very cheeky cartoon, I think it's more like a cheeky cartoon. He calls it Venus's bathing, brackets, Margate, a woman tumbling uh, in a state as nature intended headfirst into the water and distantly, probably too small to see, um, there are a crowd of people on the cliff. And in some of Rowlandson's more cheeky um, representations of the sea, uh, the gentlemen have telescopes with which to watch the bathing. The third image, very different, um, is uh, irresistible, really. I went to the Isle of Wight, Jane Austen's beloved island, and after her time, of course, Queen Victoria settled there and had Osborne House built, and she had her own bathing machine down by the sea at Osborne. Disappointingly, although you can do as I do and stand outside and photograph, you can't get inside it. But all I know is it's supposed to be very well appointed and includes a commode, which I think is very, very good for people going in the sea, not having to wee in the sea. Um, anyway, moving on. As well as giving convincing evidence of the therapeutic properties of seawater, Russell, the doctor, offered detailed advice on how to undertake a sea bathing cure. Other medical writers would follow suit. It was Russell who isolated the important features, doubtless modelling them on the protocols of the mineral water cure. And if you read about how you took the waters at Bath, there were very strict ideas of when you should do what. Key were appropriate diet, obviously, the quantities of seawater to be ingested, and the time and length of the dip. The notion of applying seawater internally, drinking it, as well as externally, is unsurprising, I think, when we consider the practice of drinking the often foul-smelling mineral waters at spas. Again, it's unsurprising that in advocating sea bathing for a large range of diseases, Russell expresses caution about attempting it without professional advice. Only a doctor, he writes, has the skill to recommend in each case how long the patient should remain in the water, what is to be done on his coming out, and at what time of day he should enter. The whole medical tribe. It's a quote, of course, from Sanderton. And this, I'm really now going to follow the evolution of medical ideas about the sea. The photograph I included as a modern one, I took one evening at lovely, lovely Lyme Regis, where we caught Jane Austen swimming earlier. A significant number of medical texts on the benefits of sea bathing followed in Russell's wake. But where Russell's writing was addressed purely to other medical professionals, and as I said, the first edition of the essay was written in Latin, the standard language of medical writing, subsequent writers addressed the general public. This democratisation of medical knowledge was not, for the most part, ideologically driven. Doctors writing after Russell reveal a new anxiety about their fees and more fundamentally their medical authority. Both were threatened once patients started willfully self-medicating by taking up sea bathing without seeking medical advice. Text after text underlines the danger to those who naively attempt to sea cure without proper professional supervision. So, for example, some 20 years late after Russell, Dr. Robert White in 1775 published The Use and Abuse of Seawater Impartially Considered. He's indignant about the sort of usurpation of medical authority. 
identifying the propensity which people of all ranks have discovered towards sea bathing. Whatever the complaint is, whether chronic or acute, the patients promise themselves relief. The patient unwarily sports with danger, suspects no evil to arise from the use of so general and popular a medicine, seldom consults those who from their observations and practice are best able to judge of the propriety of the case. To reinforce the necessity of professional advice on the subject, he lists a number of cautions. Oh, and they were going to fly in, but they're all there all together, even better. Uh, one is one dip a day. The sooner the business is over, the better. Bathing only at the proper time, ideally a little before noon. Bathing only for the proper length of time. No one should continue above a minute in the water medicinally. Excess of bathing, he warns, can cause relaxations, spasms, and many other disorders. And we'll come back to the term relaxed and relaxation later. Patients, according to White, who ignored his advice usually ended up dead. He has case histories. Some subsequent medical writing is nakedly opportunistic. In the Wellcome Library's collection of rare materials in London, there's a tiny, cheap-looking pamphlet published in 1798 by one Dr. Squirrel, entitled Maxims of Health. This pamphlet additionally offers remarks on sea and cold bathing, the effects of sea air, etc. And now we're going to just see that wording. It sounds professional enough, but I think I'll give you enough evidence here to show why I don't think it is. The author is another who insists that sea bathing, when it improperly applied, can be dangerous. He threatens readers that such unsupervised activity can have disastrous effects on the very complaints it was supposed to treat and could thus render them forever incurable. For good measure, he rants at those persons who imagine themselves qualified to judge and boldly venture of their opinion of the propriety of bathing, who have not the smallest acquaintance with anatomy, physiology, the history of diseases, the science of medicine, or philosophy in general. As a writer to this, on the back of the little pamphlet, we discover um, he recommends some tonics. So for those bent on taking uh, to the sea without his advice, he recommends a proper dose of tonic powders beforehand. And there we have at the back his adverts for his own homemade tonics. These can be purchased either in packets at two shillings and ninepence, or as tonic drops that are very, very costly, five shillings, five pence. Such quack medicines were evidently big business. Well, they always have been. In Sanderton, Mrs. Griffiths did never deviate from the strict medicinal page, except in favour of some tonic bills, pills, which a cousin of hers had a property in. Neither Mrs. Griffiths's cousin nor Dr. Squirrel, however, would get any business from Sanderton's self-reliant Diana Parker, who insists, My appetite is very much mended, I assure you. I've been taking some bitters of my own decocting, which have done wonders. By 1791, despite a certain amount of nimbyism from local residents, the general sea bathing infirmary at Margate soon to become the Royal Sea Bathing Infirmary, was successfully set up. And this was a wonderful philanthropic uh, project that was going to treat particularly the poor of London who could be um, brought round by, um, I can't remember what the big boats were called, but something, uh, to Margate to be treated with um, seawater and latterly, because it, it, it existed for a long time, with sunshine. The building is still there if you happen to go to Margate. Uh, it isn't operating as a sea bathing infirmary anymore. One of the first physicians at the General Sea Bathing Infirmary was Dr. John Anderson. His pamphlet, A Practical Essay on the Good and Bad of Effects of Seawater and Sea Bathing, was, gives us a much more nitty gritty detail. 
than previous publications about how the widespread bathing industry was operating at shore level, as it were. And what he does, and it's what you start to see in medical writing so much more um, round about the turn of the century, is he amasses um, evidence from other physicians. They correspond um, and swap breast practice. Um, so he includes medical evidence from practitioners um, working in the main Kentish resorts on the, um, it's sort of the island of Thanet, the peninsula at the end of Kent, Broadstairs, Dover, and our favourite Ramsgate. Anderson is sympathetic to the new bather who is fearful. Unlike some doctors who invade against the dangers of alcohol, Anderson re recommends timid persons to take a glass or two of generous cordial wine on entering the sea and indeed on coming out. He tells them, shut their ears, their eyes and mouth, trust their sagacious, faithful guides, and all will be well. But Anderson himself is not above recording a few of his own miraculous cure. Success story number one. A female patient who'd been six years in the East Indies with a first husband, and after bearing nine children to him and a second husband, consults him after a succession of failed sea bathing cures in Margate, which seemed to worsen her symptoms. Anderson prescribes a diet of shellfish, meat, and a few generous glasses of generous red port wine after dinner. And lo and behold, in seven days, she had not a morbid symptom. She got on horseback and rode repeatedly round the island. Uh, so there you go. The second success story was one um, which um, Anderson learnt about from um, an experienced male bathing guide in Margate. And bathing guides were, uh, men were bathing guides for men, women for women. They would stand sometimes up to their waist in seawater beside the particular bathing uh, machine they'd been hired for and help the poor sufferer into the water. It's quite a lot of debate about whether you needed to go in head first, so you really needed someone on hand. Well, according to Zachariah Brazier, this um, bathing guide, there was a Mr. Sanguinetta who had 25 years ago had universal palsy, completely paralyzed, all below his head was without sensation or motion. Brazier, assisted by his wife and three men, used to carry him into a bathing machine for regular dips in the sea. The result eventually was a complete cure. He threw away his second crutch, walked with a cane, and took up his German flute and played. I don't know why that's a cure, but apparently it is. But I like the final detail. Subsequently, his wife bore him seven children. There's a lot more said in the medical text about it, um, seawater curing infertility in women, and it's all very interesting, but I can't tell you about it today. So the question becomes, does sea bathing cure become redundant? There's a subtle shift in claims for the efficacy of sea bathing from around 1800s onwards. Sanderton has something significant to say about the medical profession's loss of authority over its patients in an era of popular medical texts encouraging self-help. Mr. Parker's conviction that an aspiring seaside resort must be in want of a physician, or if not a physician, at least an apothecary, lower down the pecking order, is paradoxical evidence of this erosion of authority. Parker judges Sanderton to be thriving when visitor numbers increase. And you'll remember those famous signifiers of on trendness, the blue shoe and the nankin boot, are seen on display in a shop window in Sanderton. Austin implies that Mr. Parker's search for a medical man for Sanderton is on a par with this window dressing. A resident doctor would, he believes, these are his words, very materially promote the rise and prosperity of the place, would in fact tend to bring a prodigious influx. Jane Austen obviously loathed that slang word prodigious. She only gives it to repellent characters like um, Lucy in Sense and Sensibility. They're always going on about things being vast and prodigious. And altogether, the emphasis has begun to shift from medically approved dips to the more general endorsements of the seaside and to the enlivening atmosphere of the resort. 
In particular, it's sea air as opposed to seawater that is increasingly cited as health giving. Although Diana Parker in Sanderton asserts, in my present state, the sea air would probably be the death of me, she turns up about two days later, her brother, Mr. Parker, believes that even his sprained ankle will respond to a little of our own bracing sea air. By 1807, when Dr. Thomas Trotter publishes his important intervention, A View of the Nervous Temperament, 1807, it's clear that the medical establishment is now being called to account. Trotter dismisses the spate of medical publications on the sea bathing cure, which, he points out, are mostly cynical attempts to get patients to purchase the so-called tonics dispensed by the book's author, as we've already discovered. Trotter is particularly scathing about the more preposterous claims some modern physicians continue to make for the necessity of seeking medical advice before bathing. These, Trotter writes, are simply greedy attempts to bring it under their control. He then makes the wonderfully common sense observation, leaving aside all these gentlemen in full possession of their theories, I must beg to consider it, sea bathing, principally as an exercise and amusement. Trotter does recommend seaside watering places as highly beneficial to nervous people who will benefit by shaking off indolent customs and forcing themselves into company and cheerful society. Nervous people were thought to be particularly prone to a condition which was of central importance to Georgian medicine, and that is hypochondria. A tricky term, as I'll try and explain. It's curious for us because its modern usage, our usage, is so far removed from its historic one. In its dominant 18th century sense, hypochondria was a recognisable physical disease located in a sufferer's hypochondries, the lower abdomen. Its chief symptoms were digestive disorders, but it was also attended by melancholy or depression as the very, very uh, well, highly esteemed Scottish doctor, William Cullen, wrote in 1777, um, a languor, a listlessness, or want of resolution and activity with respect to all undertakings, a disposition to seriousness, sadness, and timidity. Roy Porter, the late lamented, in his introduction to his edition of George Cheney's The English Malady, published in 1733, has shown how well-to-do patients could be proud to proclaim they were suffering from hypochondria, as it was believed to afflict only the elite of society. He wrote in English, reassuringly, that it only affected those of the liveliest and quickest natural paths, whose faculties are the brightest and most spiritual. Their genius is most keen and penetrating. They're sensitive to the most delicate sensations and taste, both of pleasure and pain. Fools, weak or stupid persons, on the other hand, are seldom much troubled with vapours or lowness of spirits. Developments in the medical understanding of the nervous system allowed the educated public to view their tendency to melancholy as a direct result of their especially refined nerves. Again, um, I present you with Mrs. Bennett. Cheney offered a reassuring analysis, the combination of refined nerves and the wonderful, increasingly luxurious Georgian lifestyle of the middle and upper classes had unimaginable luxuries, rich food and wine, transported from all quarters of the globe. They were themselves carried from one site of pleasure to another in sedan chairs. This meant that hypochondria was the preserve of a society's elite. Cheney insisted that melancholy or hypochondria, almost synonymous terms, was a recognisable physical disease, as I said. And importantly, Cheney insisted it was quite separate from madness. It's why when... um, I'm going to forget his name now, I'm just busking. Uh... Haley, William Haley wrote the, um, well, the edition of William Cooper's letters that formed the first biography. He 
made very much of the fact that he suffered from melancholy and hypochondria, but therefore could not be mad. William Cullen, however, understood hypochondria to be idiopathic, the medical term which basically means we don't know. Importantly, Cullen, and we're back in 1777, Cullen identified hypochondria as a disorder of the mind rather than the body, describing sufferers thus, and this is the meaning closest to what we understand. Sufferers from hypochondria are particularly attentive to the state of their own health, to even the smallest change of feelings in their bodies. And from any unusual feeling, perhaps of the slightest kind, they apprehend great danger and even death itself. In respect to all these feelings of observation, there is commonly the most obstinate belief and persuasion. Cullen, therefore, articulates what will come to be the dominant meaning of hypochondria as we now understand it. So we return to Sanderton and the sea bathing cure. In Sanderton, Jane Austen gives the same robust common sense as Trotter to the Charlotte who, hearing the tribulations of the Parker siblings, suspects in her words a good deal of fancy, imagination, in such an extraordinary state of health. Observing Miss Parker's constant use of salts and drops, she thinks there are no symptoms which would not respond simply to putting out the fire, opening the window, and disposing of the drops and the salts. To uh, youngest son Arthur's self-diagnosis, she speaks out. As far as I can understand, Charlotte says to Arthur, what nervous, sure as, as far as I can understand what nervous complaints are, I have a great idea of the efficacy of air and exercise for them. Daily, regular exercise. And I should recommend rather more of it to you than I suspect you are in the habit of taking. Lady Denham, another character in the book, is equally forthright, but her target is the medical profession. A doctor at Sanderton would, she believes, be only encouraging our servants and the poor to fancy themselves ill. And she blames the death of her second husband, Sir Harry, on a physician's expensive interventions. At 70, Lady Dem has never consulted one, nor taken physic above twice. Commercially savvy, however, she keeps milk asses uh, recommending their milk to the sufferers of consumption. Um, and another good old fashioned preventive. Now, it's the chamber horse. You may know about this. I was disappointed when I first discovered what they looked like. This one is a, a photograph of um, the chamber horse kept by John Wesley in his house, another house you can visit in London. And as you can see, it's a chair sort of upholstered with stout cushions. And the idea was you grasped the um, arms of it and you bounce yourself up and down um, to get exercise to exercise your hypochondries. Um, George Cheney, the doctor we mentioned, had been advocating the use of chamber horses for winter exercise. He, he wanted you to go riding otherwise since at least 1840 when he recommended one to Samuel Richardson. Cheney had long argued for the importance of exercise, explaining in the English malady that riding was particularly effective for the elementary instruments and hypochondries to be most shaken and exercised. According to Lady Denham, she can easily supply one at a fair rate. Brackets. Poor Mr. Hollis's chamber horse. As good as new, Austin dryly suggesting the item in question did its owner no good. Poor Mr. Hollis, her first husband, is of course dead. Long since. Unlike the healthy Lady Denham, however, the Parker siblings have an obsessive interest in health. Aside from Mr. Woodhouse, they are Austin's most colourful hypochondriacs. But as we've noted, it's curious that in 1817, Jane Austen doesn't use the term. Yet Diana, Susan and Arthur pa Parker fit the bill precisely. As William Cullen wrote, it's said to be the manner of hypochondriacs to change often their physician and we learn that the Parkers have consulted physician after physician in vain, have entirely done with the whole medical tribe. Jane Austen clearly understood the ludicrous claims of hypochondriacs from Mr Woodhouse's obsessive fear of wedding cake and slight breezes to the Parkers' floridore of personalised symptoms. 
Arthur Parker's conviction that without butter, dry toast is far from being wholesome, recalls Mr Woodhouse's well-known advocacy of boiled eggs. But Arthur's conviction that toast hurts the coats of the stomach suggests in his knowledge of basic anatomy that he's far more access to popular medical texts than Mr Woodhouse. And I want to restate this important point that although Jane Austen evidently knows a hypochondriac when she sees one, she does not use either the term or its cognates. Yet the word itself in 1817 continued to be used as a valid medical term denoting a disease of the digestive system. It's interesting, therefore, in Mr Parker's extensive and eccentric lexicon, hypochondria makes no appearance, when we might expect it in his list of the C's miraculous properties. And here we'll um, have a look at the next slide and I'll just pick out the key moment here. And I've put it in bold. Uh, the sea air and sea bathing were anti-spasmodic, anti-pulmonary, anti-septic, we think Jane Austen meant, anti-bilious and anti-rheumatic. Anti-spasmodic was a conventional medical term. Quincy's lexicon medicum of the same year, 1817, defines spasmodic as the power of allaying or removing inordinate motions in the system. It covers everything from diarrhoea to epileptic fits. Effective antispasmodic remedies, according to Cullen, including asafoetida, castor oil and musk, but the most useful, needless to say, were opium and wine. The term antiseptic, appears occasionally in medical texts, but anti-pulmonary, anti-bilious, and anti-rheumatic are Parker's own inventions, well, obviously Jane Austen's. It's noteworthy that he could, but doesn't make a claim for the C's being anti-hypochondriacal. And what about Mr. Parker's claim the sea air and sea bathing were healing, softing, relaxing, fortifying, and bracing, seemingly just as was wanted, sometimes one, sometimes the other. The valences of the words are interesting. Where we've seen hypochondria become a pejorative term, relaxing goes in the opposite direction. To have physiologically relaxed nerves in the 18th and early 19th century was to have nerves lacking in power, dangerously unresponsive. But by including relaxing in his list of beneficial qualities of the seaside, Mr Parker appears to be drawing on a new understanding of the word that was only just coming into use. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the sense of relaxed, as in free from anxiety, first appeared in 1773, and its second quoted use is from a novel which we know Jane Austen knew, Lady Morgan's The Wild Irish Girl of 1806. When Charlotte first meets Susan Parker, however, she observes that in comparison with her sister Diana, she's more thin and worn by illness and medicine, more relaxed in air and more subdued in voice, her relaxed air implying weakness and languor. In cases of miscarriage, our Dr Thomas Trotter said that in 90 cases out of 100, it may be imputed to a relaxed nervous frame. What Mr Parker's use of relaxing therefore suggests is that he's freely appropriating medical terms to suit his own needs, without a clear sense of their meaning. What is particularly significant, and I will be coming to an end because I've improvised slightly too much. Uh, we have a page left. Um, what's particularly significant in Austin's presentation of hypochondria, in our sense, is the three adult Parkers who enjoy the status, if not the title of hypochondriacs, do not suffer from hypochondria's concomitant melancholy. They're not the first hypochondriacs to fret about symptoms while evidently being in robust health. They're perhaps descendants of Molière's La Malade Imaginaire, translated into English in 1714 as the hypochondriac. But where Mr Woodhouse and his daughter Isabella clearly share a nervous temperament and suffer chronically from anxiety, the Parkers seem worryingly well. We'll never know whether a newly mentioned character, the sickly heiress Miss Lamb, is a genuine invalid or a hypochondriac in either senses of the word. All we can say for sure that she, poor thing, is obliged to undergo the full medically supervised sea bathing cure, including being dipped from a bathing machine. A final unknown is where Jane Austen found the medical language she gleefully supplies for Parker. 
there's a high likelihood her family would have had a copy of William Buchan's Domestic Medicine, an immensely popular book, regularly reprinted. From 1803 onwards, it included an additional essay about sea bathing. We can only speculate, and now I'm coming to an end. Um, we can only speculate on the reason Austin refused to use the term hypochondria. Possibly it was out of tact. Her mother's tendency to fret over health is well documented. We know for certain is that Austin rarely spoke of her own illness and remember she was dying when she was writing this. When towards the end she did mention her own symptoms, she reckoned what she was suffering from was biliousness. It's a sad irony, probably a deliberate one, that one of her arch hypochondriacs, Diana, suffers from attacks of her old grievance, spasmodic bile. And there we go, thank you for that slide. And that's and that it's the one condition Arthur is sure he's not suffering from. If I were bilious, he continued, you know wine would disagree with me, but it always does me good. The more wine I drink, in moderation, the better I am. Beneath the broad comedy of Sanderton, Austin has explored the limitations of contemporary medicine. But on the other hand, we know Austin's fondness for a glass of wine. Perhaps there she's having the last light. laugh. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for that, Jane. Oh, I overran. It was 39 minutes. Oh, then, <laughs> oh no. It was just so fun. much to say, though. I mean, really yeah. just so much detail. Thank you so much. A reminder to everybody who is watching, you can still get your questions in. Either drop your questions in the chat or email them to us at info at janeaustinandco.org. And I will leave that up there if you would like to email in your questions. So we have a question to start that I think uh, you will be well equipped to answer. Uh, and this is about Cowper, uh, Cooper. Uh, yeah. Did Cooper's uh, 1789 poem on the benefits said to be already received by his majesty from sea bathing, marking George III's recovery from madness, influence the popularity of the topic in Austin? Oh, that is such a good reference. Thank you very, very much. Um, I am pretty sure it would, um, although Cooper himself earlier had commenting on, and I can't remember the exact quote, but the kind of madness with which everyone rushed to the sea. But it is interesting that we know that uh, George III was dipped, of course, in Weymouth. Uh, and apparently they have his sea bathing chariot on a roundabout, on a circle in on the main road going to Weymouth. I haven't been to see it myself. But almost certainly, um, I mean, to have royal approval must have made a difference. Um, slightly more difficult when he reverted to madness, however. <clears throat> but thank you. That's for me. Thank you. <laughs> um, what about um, when did bathing become swimming? That um, again, such an interesting question. I be I spent a long time trying to work out whether people actually swam, mm -hmm. um, because I mean I can show people definitely swimming later in the nineteenth century and obviously in the twentieth century, but I suspect they just sort of frolicked in the sea. Um, going back in time, there are some very interesting histories of swimming. Um, it was generally considered rather infra dig. It was all right to swim in a river. Eton schoolboys swam in the Thames. But um, I think it was generally approved when the army, they thought it was worth teaching soldiers because they might actually needed it, need it. But um, it's a strange one. And you wonder what opportunities people got, got before you had warm water. Swimming bars. The um, when you just sorry, just to follow up on that, when you mentioned William Buchan, is that the B U C H A N last That's name? That's it. Yes, domestic yes. medicine has been around. There were reprints. If you look in Echo, there are endless reprints. It was the it was in everybody's house. We because he also wrote a little piece called "The New Art of Swimming." Oh, and I have now forgotten that. Um, and and that, I it's in the 1803 or 84 edition is by his son Alexander, but I'm, I might be wrong. Um, but the Alexander writes a separate book later on. Okay, um, very interesting. Thank you. 
I keep breaking up, so I don't know if I'm going to be much use here. But um, I was following up from Ingrid's question about swimming. Um, hmm. Did did they also consider? I mean, in England, going to the continent um, to swim in the Mediterranean was was that a you know also health giving or was that something entirely different? It's tricky because, of course, for most of Jane Austen's life, the continent was out of bounds, except for mm. 1808 because of the Napoleonic Wars. And as far as I can see, reading guidebooks to the continent over the whole long period, the continent still held very strongly the tradition of going to, the, to mineral spas um, more than the sea. So somewhere like Cannes in the south of France, and I can't put a precise date on it, um, only becomes fashionable from having been a little fishing resort when an Englishman, whose name I currently forget, went there, took a house there and kind of established it. So I think it's much later to pick up. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I can never get a very clear vision of is that even if people live by the sea, um, I think children probably ran into the sea and swam, but as far as I can see, most adults didn't. I'm told but in some remote Greek islands, uh, the older generation of women, certainly, they might live right by the beach, but they would not have gone in the water. Um, so it's very curious. What I like with um, Queen Victoria's bathing machine, there's a, there are information panels around it, is that um, Prince Albert designed a sort of floating wooden surround, like a, almost like a paddling pool, to float in the water, and then their numerous offspring could hang off it and learn to swim from that. So he was a great advocate of swimming. Um, so we have another question from oh. the audience. Were there moral texts addressing the dangers of the seaside resorts, as we saw with Georgiana and Lydia in opposing uh, medical texts? Uh, so is there like this idea that it might be like good for your physical health, but maybe bad for your spiritual or moral health? Lovely idea. There was a lot of anxiety around. It's why I ended up writing an article. It's in the TLS somewhere in its archives about terrible anxiety about male nude bathing in the Victorian period. It was easy to research because you've got so many newspapers that are searchable then, much less easy in um, Georgian period. Um, I think what I have read when people are advocating the seaside is very much trying to see it within the kind of protocols of the um, mineral spas, a place where you should behave properly. One writer, I think around 1814, was saying we should have a master of ceremonies at the seaside, the same as you do at Bath. So keep order. And also the, 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 the implicit message is also keep the working class. You don't want working class people larking around. Um, they were onto a loser there because, of course, as soon as we started getting railways, um, everybody flocked to the seaside, and quite rightly. Um, so, no, I haven't seen, although if anyone finds some, that would be fabulous to know. Thank you, Maria. Um, you, you touched on uh, on enjoyment a little bit. I noticed, I think it was in a quote from Trotter that yes. there was the mention of enjoyment. Um, what was... Um, I guess I'm curious about the connection between enjoyment and health, or, or maybe it wasn't a utilitarian uh, sense of enjoyment. When, how does it figure into this history of sea bathing? Well, I found it fascinating when Trotter said that, and then looking back over Jane Austen, clearly just having a good time romping Thank around you. in the sea, because, um, and in fact, that's where you get little glimpses. So. I'm just trying to think of things I have looked at. Charles Lamb writing a very, very funny piece about all the lambs, his family, going to cows on the Isle of Wight and again, larking around, overturning a boat, just having fun. Um, so I think the medical discourse, it's easy to sort of imagine that's all we knew because I suspect people always know how to go and enjoy themselves. Right. And what seaside resorts, as they developed, like Mr. Parker and Sanderton, would have a circulating library and shops and maybe um, an assembly room and so on. So, yes, pleasure. And also there's a strong business incentive, as we can see in Sanderton. But pleasure, but um, pleasure that needs to be regulated. Um, but I just love when you get the glimpses of individual people 
um, either having fun or hating it um, <laughs> because the medical staff was so austere. And I, I can't imagine anything worse than having to go take a dip in Ramsgate in December in the snow. Yeah. I, there are people who do this thing, but it isn't me. Um, so as I say, I don't think it's a moral thing. I think it's just... Um, and I've been collecting up quotes over over time because it's so irresistible uh, of people either having fun or there's a nice one of um, if you remember Kilvert's diary in the later a uh, 19th century, and he goes to and I'm pretty sure it's the Isle of Wight, and he's furious with the morality which now insists that gentlemen wear cotton drawers with, to swim, and he has a terrible time because his cotton drawers kind of start falling off, he trips over them, he gets cut on the rocks. And he says, why can't you bathe naked like nature intended? But um, so there are bad times. And the other person who has um, eventually a terrible time at the seaside is Dickens, who um, he normally goes to Broadstairs and very nice it is too. If you've been to Broadstairs, um, it's where he started David Popfield. And it's a rather lovely, very sort of a curved beach, which is very um, gentle and sheltered. Um, and he took his family there for years until he discovered Italy. And then one day he went to the Isle of Wight and thought, I was thrilled by this. This was going to be the new thing. He was writing to all his friends saying, I've taken the house for the summer. You've got to come. It's only about seven hours from London. Um, he's diverted a little stream in the grounds of the house to become a shower bath on the beach. Nothing could be nicer. And then what he hits is British weather. So his enthusiastic letters change. It rains all the time. His mate, John Leach, one of the cartoonists for Punch, comes to say and nearly kills himself in the waves. And basically, Dickens goes silent, never writes about it again, but he does set the, um, am I going to remember their name, in our mutual friend, who are the nouveau riche family, the Veneerings, have a very, very unhappy honeymoon there, just saying. So <laughs> unhappy. It almost, it almost sounds like Mrs. Elton's waning enjoyment of strawberry picking. Oh, absolutely. Oh, isn't that just wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. In fact, I was thinking about her reading out the, the, the Mr. Parker's ones, because those uses of hyphens are so eloquent, yeah. you know, listing stuff without drawing breath. Um, yes. Susan? Uh, we yeah, this is kind of an interesting question, and there's more on another panel, but um, are there, do we know anything today about what might have been or what they might have thought were the benefits of consuming seawater, or is there any scientific mm. explanation for the curative qualities of sea and seawater? Well, there was a lot of um, evidence gathered by various doctors. There's one, his name I at the moment forget, where he insisted on taking his poor servant into the water with a big glass thermometer to measure his temperature to see if that was making any difference. Unfortunately, he <laughs> got knocked over and the thermometer broke. Um, the drinking it, as I say, I can only see it by um, a parallel with drinking the water from mineral spas. And in fact, the very oh, yeah. first seaside resort Scarborough is where there was also a mineral spa at Scarborough that happened to pour out naturally from the rocks on the beach. So some of the first engravings I looked at from 1700 show little figures queuing on the beach um, just to taste the waters. And mm -hmm. then um, I like looking at them over that over a few years you suddenly see a kind of establishment is set up for the people taking the waters, and then you see the sea bathing huts. So people are starting in the water. Um, I imagine, I suppose, as a sort of emetic, it might have done people good. God knows why. Um, I mean, it's interesting now because there's so much interest now in cold water bathing, so that actually the seawater, um, plus, of course, being, um, to sound like Mr Parker, antiseptic, um, you know, bathing in salt water has, all, you know, has a good provenance. So... Um, I think there is. I don't think anyone's going to recommend we drink it now, um, especially not on the coast of the UK, which are going to be rather polluted. Um, but um, yes, I think the, the sea bathing holds sway still as a really sort of a decent thing for your health. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a dip being about a minute long. Was that fairly standard or did they possibly stay in longer? 
they long. I suspect, like Jane Austen, they larked around as they wanted to. I think if you'd employed a bathing guide, and while there was still quite a tendency, as I say, to dip people in head first, um, one doctor recommended oil skin bathing caps to put over your hair. Other people said, don't use a bathing cap. You want the salt water to wash away, you know, the impurities. Um, but I think that if you dipped in head first, there's not much chance of staying in longer than a minute. Um, but I suspect, and looking at cartoons as time progresses, one suspect people very happily just bobbed around in the sea. Um, there are an awful lot of cartoons that from the 19th century, which are wonderful, after Gilray and Rowlandson's um, very rather saucy cartoons of the of this. And here is a very uh, a direct uh, question. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yes, interesting one. Um, on the plus side, I'm not a sewage expert, but I have just reviewed a book with a very interesting history by my friend Nick Hyam on how water was brought to London over the ages, um, including in wooden pipes, uh, later uh, lead ones. Um, luckily, I don't think there was such efficient sewage dis. Disposal. I mean, not so nice for those living amongst it, but I don't think you have as much going into the sea, sadly, as we do now. Um, interesting. I would, I would worry about swimming in it, you know, at any period. But um, it doesn't get discussed. But then lots of things like that don't just get discussed. You're not going to get Jane Austen on the subject, obviously. Um, so, but what I do know, and I can't put a date on this is that um, canny companies started exporting seawater, um, either bottling it or in pipes to London, where you could then, and then it could be warm in sea bathing establishments. I mean, some, there were sea bathing establishments on the coast where they warmed up the seawater. Um, or, as I say, to London. So um, I think generally seawater seemed to have this magical property and uh, people luckily didn't know too much about sewage. Um, I, I I've been thinking about what you said about class earlier mm -hmm. and you know trying to separate people. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you see those um, paintings by Turner, um, especially in Constable, where people mm -hmm. are kind of walking around the the yes. um, the beach and you've got some people who are clearly working class, you know, digging and, and mm -hmm. Um, you know, tending nets and that sort of thing. And then you've got other people who are, are more in the line of tourists walking. What Absolutely. about for sea bathing? Did they, did they really make an effort to define certain areas of the beach that would only be um, for sea bathing? Accessible? Um, yeah. That's a sort of huge and important question because um, the book that influenced me most, and I highly recommend it, is Alain Corbin, C-O-R-B-I-N, The Invention of the Sea. It's a delightful book. Um, his, he tends to write more about France than, than the UK. But he said that for centuries we hated the sea. It was full of monsters in the old days, uh, the sort of effluvia of nature, dead things. And that the shore, in as much as it was anything, was the fisherman's workplace. There was no magic to the seashore. And it wasn't till he reckons it was Dutch painters at the end of the 17th century who started painting the shore, particularly the one at, just outside the Hague, Schwenen, ding, 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 can't pronounce it. Um, a lot of lovely paintings from there that suggest people were starting to appreciate the aesthetic qualities of walking on the shore. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, all the, the Turner's pictures of the, the fishermen, um, I think they probably just coexisted. Um, and fishermen, of course, traditionally, apparently even now, tend not to swim. Um, there's a wonderful fisherman museum up on the east coast of Scotland in Anstruther, and I cross-examined them about this. And they said, no, generally, there's a huge superstition, or there was, about fishermen learning to swim. Because if you, your boat capsized, you wanted to drown. You didn't want, if you swam, you'd die a horrible death. So you just wanted to drown quickly. Um, so the thing with fishermen, um, 
I mean, certainly as the sea bathing took off as a commercial proposition and you had kind of like taxi ranks, you had ranks for the um, bathing heart, bathing machines. I imagine more and more of the beach got sort of taken over for commercial reasons. Um, and also all those things Mr. Parker doesn't like are sort of slimy rocks and seaweed and stuff. So I imagine the fishermen kept to that. Um, and there was quite a move in some places to keep a completely separate beach for men and boys to swim in rather than offending nice families who didn't want to be exposed to the horrors of male nudity. Yes. Thanks. Uh, this is a question I'm actually very curious about as well, is uh, is there any evidence that these ideas about salt water that we saw popular in England filtered across the Atlantic to the American? Uh, well, what are we colonies, I guess, quite at the point where uh, some of the Austin stuff is happening, but um, with, what are the transatlantic connections there? Such a good question, and I'm not fully informed on this, so I do remember reading something about it. Um, I think in the way of all these things, ideas spread fast. So I imagine, but I'm hesitating, um, because I don't know, well, I know a bit of the East Coast of America. Um, I mean, you wouldn't want to swim in DC in the Potomac, would you? Um, no, I'm <laughs> just saying. Um, I do not know, and I should read it, but I'd love to hear more, Mary, if you do some research on it. I would love to know more about, um, how this spread to the American colonies. So. Yeah, I, th I think I, I would kind of agree with you about having that same kind of thing of like, where do I know this from? So yes, yes, I am struggling. <laughs> but um, I do, I'm inclined to agree that it did make its way over. Hmm. I would have thought so. Uh, this, this might be a bit off the wall, but when you were um, describing, I think it was from the Cullen uh, description yes. of hypochondria, hmm. which started to resemble more our understanding. Mm. Um, it was something like attended to the smallest changes in feeling in the body, etc. I couldn't believe, I, I mean, I couldn't uh, help but think about um, the connection to sensibility and the whole culture of yes. sensibility and the, the valuing yeah. of just that kind of attention to small. Of course, and that works brilliantly for looking at medical ideas in the later 18th century. Um, because that all ties in with what Cheney had argued earlier in the 1730s, that to be to suffer from melancholy was a sign of great sensibility. Um, I think in somewhere in Sanderton, um, our sensible character, Clara, um, name checks man of feeling. Um, so yes, I think it was very much associated and therefore the idea, it's odd that Cullen's idea takes so long to really filter down because I think people are very attached to the idea that your um, melancholia or, or your hypochondria were explainable by physical causes and were not a terrible slur. So even when um, Thomas Carlyle and Jane Carlyle, um, when they died, so we're talking now later 19th century, and one of the first biographies comes out by Froude. Um, the Americans under, I think it's Caroline Norton, were absolutely appalled by the suggestion that Carlyle might be anything less than a perfect husband. And they get um, a famous British psychiatrist. Again, his name escapes me at this moment, but he's double barreled and, and he lived for far too long. And he writes a prologue saying, Jane Carlyle was completely different from her husband. Yes, they both suffered from the same symptoms, stomach aches, headaches, all sorts of distress. But she was suffering, let's make it clear, from, now, how does he describe it? Uh, the condition sort of associated with the climacteric, her menopause, that was her problem. And with Carlyle, no, this was, his was hypochondria, and he's writing this in sort of 18, about 1880, 1890, I think, is saying it's the hypochondria attendant on men of genius. So he's still using that term, although really it's mm. gone out, out of date, to separate off not only hypochondria from anything else, but also to gender it now in a very unpleasant way. But, um, oh, that's Jane so Malone. interesting. Yes. But, in a way, but in a way that sense of, I mean, 
sensibility still is tied to a medical explanation. It's just a substitution of digestive system for the to the nervous system, right? Yes. And I think with, with um, you know, if Mrs. Bennett can say it's her nerves, um, I don't know what having a low serotonin level is. I mean, I invoke it <laughs> uh, quite happily, but I don't. I get the feeling that doctors don't really know why anti antidepressants work. They seem to, so that's good. Um, but it is strange that, yes, they simply transfer the, the reasoning to something that publicly we all grasp. We have an uh, imbalance in our biochemistry, and that's why we get depressed. Um, no, it is a mystery and a fascinating one, I think. Thank um, you. How are we doing for time? Uh, I think we have time for a, one more question. We have another one from the audience. Yes. Um, what percentage of people <laughs> drowned given the type of bathing outfits <laughs> the women wore? I think this is such a good question. <laughs> such a good question. Um, <coughs> I wish I knew. Um, what I managed to glean on drowning was partly trotting through these rather dry archives in Kent, which recorded numbers of drowning. It tended to be male, um, tended to be fishermen, tended to be sailing accidents. I don't think I ever got one um, about what women were wearing. Um, I'm scrolling through my memory of the advent of dedicated team of people to rescue oh the, the, the humane society set up really yes. very early i've got a feeling it was as early as the 1790s but i may be wrong and they would um rescue people drowning and in cities as well so it was a particularly well um a case where a poor kid walks into a shop of some sort and the trap doors open and the child falls down directly into a wide sewer and somebody does manage to pull him out and rescue him. I don't know, and the costume seems so ridiculously impractical. I suspect it's why they just hung around the bathing machine and frolicked rather than, you couldn't have swum an inch in those. Um, I, I see them and I just think of how heavy they must have been. And also, you, know, you quite often hired them so that that picture with the ladies in the kind of brown calico, they were obviously hiring a bathing a wet i imagine bathing dress <laughs> and be absolutely hideous. um so yes you, you can't imagine they could do very much in in that sort of rig out and it's not really till i think france has always leads the way and you start getting articles in magazines later in the 19th century about fashionable wear at the seaside and then once you start getting to the 1920s and 30s, you get articles on the French. What jewellery should be worn on the beach? <laughs> a cork necklace, you know, lovely. So it bounces around. Um, but yes, you're right. I mean, absolutely. It's probably why, you know, not many women, I would have thought, learned to swim in those days. Um, so. That's delightful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jane. This was just absolutely delightful. Thank you. Um, so much. And we are so pleased to have had you join us. And for everybody watching at home, stick around. We still have a few announcements before we leave for the evening. So coming up next is our last talk Ooh. of this series. This is the Questionable Comforts of Home Cures, where we're going to learn all about, uh, you know, medicines made at home, but also some of the uh, pros and cons of using some of those. And this is going to be with food historian Julian Gehrer on May 23rd. As always, you can register for free at janeaustinandco.org slash sign up. And we look forward to having you there. Wonderful. Am I back? <laughs> yes, you are back. Okay. Okay, well, um, I also want to remind everyone that registration for JASP, the Jane Austen Summer Program 2023, is still open. Um, this year, our theme is Jane Austen's Teenage Writings, and first time uh, JASP attendees get a 20% uh, <laughs> discount on registration with the code FIRSTJASP2023. 
So please join us in Chapel Hill, North Carolina for a weekend of balls, workshops, discussion groups, lectures, um, and other uh, exciting activities that don't involve technical failures. And um, <laughs> for, for um, speakers, uh, we have Katie Childs from Chotten House, who you heard earlier this season talking about women botanists, Juliet McMaster, who's um, published zillions of things on the juvenilia, Camille Ogawa, who also um, we've heard uh, in in uh, the um, Austin or the Asia, Asia and the Regency series, uh, Maria Grace and Sayantani Dasgupta, two writers of children's and young adult books, and Whit Stillman, the um, writer and director of Love and Friendship, the movie based on um, Lady Susan. So. Yes, and um, th so this program was supported in part by North Carolina Humanities, an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, and we also like to thank UNC's Humanities for the Public Good, which was a project of the college, which is a project of the College of Arts and Sciences at UNC, with the support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Thank and you. And we all would so like much. to thank all of our uh, donors who donated to help support this talk. Thank you guys so much. Your support is invaluable and to us. Most of all, thank you, Jane, for being here today. Yes. It's a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Have a Bye, good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>